Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased to have with me today the two authors of the book titled Social Media and the Automatic Production of Memory, Classification, Ranking and the Sorting of the Past, published by Bristol University Press in 2021. The book does a lot of interesting things that are very much at the forefront of, I think, of a lot of ours daily lives, even if we don't really think about it or realize it's happening. Mainly, how does social media impact memories and how we remember? So I'm very pleased to have both the authors, Dr. Ben Jacobson and Dr. David Beer, with us to tell us about their book. Ben, Dave, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for the invite. Thank you. Thank you. Very pleased to have you both here. Can we start off with a bit of an introduction of yourselves and explain why this book and why write it together? Uh, Perhaps, Ben, you can start us off. Yeah, of course. Um, So I think the the book sort of grew out of, uh, I was doing my PhD at the time, and the PhD sort of very broadly explored the idea, exactly as you mentioned, the ideas of of social media uh, and memory, and also sort of linking it into how ideas of data and algorithms as well, how they sort of all come together to impact how we understand memory and what memory actually is and i was doing my phd with with dave as well so he was my he was my phd supervisor and we a lot of a lot of the conversations that we had uh about the project and about the data that i had um and i was in the process of writing some some papers and obviously writing the phd but this sort of the the stuff for the book was sort of quite supplementary and we were currently working on a paper together uh that didn't really fit the normal paper format really because it was it was too long and it was a bit it was pulling in 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 two sort of different directions and and basically dave had the idea of of let's just turn it into a book and 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 sort of from there kind of the sections expanded and we sort of brought in extra material and and sort of thought about um you know sort of different ideas and concepts and how we can sort of turn the question around so it's very much based around one particular case study in many ways but it's it's very much trying to conceptualize exactly what's going on in this sort of landscape of memory devices, technology and memory, really. So that's that's really where it began. Thank you for that. Um, Dave, is there anything you'd like to say on that introductory point? Uh, no, just that uh, I was working, I've been working on um, trying to understand the uh, sort of sociology of algorithms since about sort of 2007, 2008 in different areas. And this was one of those areas. So it was a, a really good opportunity to work with Ben to um, to develop the idea around uh, algorithms and, and memory in particular in this instance. Mm, great. Thank you for that start. Um, ben, I'm, I'm pleased, in fact, that you already brought up the idea that this really wouldn't have worked as a journal article um, because one of the first things I noticed is like, wow, okay, this is a big topic. This is an important topic. There's so many ways one could look at this. So can you introduce us a bit to the scope and focus of the book and perhaps especially how did you determine this? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because so the PhD itself and um, and, and the way the sort of together with, with Dave, the way we sort of um, kind of framed, framed the PhD thesis, which was like, you know, where we could spend quite a few years on it was very much looking at about 20 or so different features uh, and looking at the functionality of each one in detail and then really getting to the nitty gritty of how they work on a software level, but also on a sort of discursive level as well in terms of the industry documents behind it. But I think that the interesting thing with the book um, was was the, the idea of looking at one particular feature almost as a sort of a, as an archetypical feature for like, how can we then sort of use this as a springboard to understand you know sort of other features that exist out there because i mean as you're saying i mean it's a huge topic and it's getting bigger and bigger as well um with a lot of functionalities sort of being incorporated into smartphones into uh into databases and archives so it's not like it's not that we're just working with standalone features either i mean facebook memory is very much uh it's it's an indelible part of the platform itself and uh, as i was just reading this morning is that one of the things that the platform what they write on there in their help center section is that they say is that you can sort of you know control what's inside memory so you can sort of tweak elements of it as a user but you can never turn it off it's one of those features that you can never turn off it's always there even if you don't want to engage with it if you engage with the platform itself you'll still have to engage with it 
So it, it became interesting, but, and it also gave us a bit of a focus. So I think the problem is that with this being so many, the problem is that you don't want to get too much drowned in the technical detail of it without thinking, actually, in terms of a bigger picture, how does this, you know, sort of speak to culture in general in terms of what this says about memory in general. So I, I think focusing on on one feature gave us gave us a way in in a way as well because it also made it easier in terms of doing field work and, and interviewing um you know sort of people in everyday life in terms of how they use the platform it sort of gave us you know sort of a hook for them to sort of say actually how do we engage with this platform and it also gave us some points of comparison because people who use sort of apple smartphones as well like you know they were able to compare and say well actually how does facebook compare to some of the things that you might encounter you know, in other aspects of your life. So so in many ways, it sort of gave us the focus, but at the same time, I think it gave us sort of a springboard to conceptualize this relationship between technology and memory further than just the platform itself, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that does that does make sense. Um, Dave, is there anything you'd like to add here? Uh, no, I think that that's it, really. We're just trying to think about how um, memory was changing as a result of these technologies and um, trying to understand the, the, how these broader developments were impacting on the how memory as a concept is is understood really that's one of the, one of the key things that we we're trying to get at i think through this focus upon a particular set of developments so that's in fact something i'd love to ask you a bit more about dave we've mentioned these broader developments that this is part of can we talk about what those are um that are impacting memory making processes yeah so i think well the the, the main thing was the integration of algorithms in, into everyday life. So the decision-making parts of code being um, embedded into everyday structures that make decisions on our behalf. Um, and in this case, what we were thinking about is the relationship really between um, classification and ranking, I would say, are the two kind of component parts of what we were what we were trying to look at um, and how algorithms intervene in this sort of classification and ranking of, of, of culture more generally, in this case, of memories. So there was a one thing we'd observed with social media was that they're increasingly becoming kind of memory devices, that they were archives of people's everyday lives who've been captured in social media over a long period of time, and also in their phones as well, because similar things are going on with just people's phones. So they're repackaging memories, delivering it back to them. So we thought it's interesting here how that occurs. So the two kind of sets of process around classification and ranking are much broader sets of developments about with all this content around us, how can we possibly manage it all? So one way is through classificatory systems, in this case, memories being classified. Um, And the second then is, well, how, how do you then filter and sort those classifications? And it's ranking processes that work there. So we saw the way that memories are being classified and how then there would be a rank to surface them. So it was the automation of the classification and ranking of culture. There's the broader kind of set of transformations that the book speaks to. And in this case, we're looking at the classification and ranking of something as intimate and personal as what we remember. So that that those things, the content is classified as a type of memory, ranked and then delivered back to us as a kind of pre-packaged memory that's very different to how we might understand memory in general. Hmm. And I think that automation, just to to sort of add to that, is is quite important as well because I think one thing that we sort of mentioned in the beginning of the book where we draw parallels to ideas of archiving, for example, is that I think one thing that sort of uh, distinguishes the developments we're seeing now with social media and algorithms is compared to sort of previous times is that we've always had historically we've always had devices uh to store memories um as as a way you know even if it's like books or photo albums or different forms of archives that there has always been things around us that we're able to able to use to store memories so that we can revisit them again but i think what, what we're sort of as we were discussing ideas for the book one thing that we thought was really interesting is with a lot of these develops that we're seeing now is that we're seeing memory not just being archived by these platforms and and being you know sort of sitting there dormant and waiting for users to engage with them but they're actively being pushed out at users right so so users now take on a i mean you could even say uh take on a more passive role in a way because you know because platforms are actively intervening with when and how people should engage with the past really mm. 
So I think then we want to kind of get into the specifics of this platform. Given what we can see about this automation and the memories that are being, as you said, sort of packaged up for us, what definition can we deduce Facebook is using for what they consider a memory? Yeah, so I so I think so we begin sort of thinking. Let's let's look at some of the material that that Facebook Facebook has published about you know some um, some of the things that you know they kind of when they rolled out the feature. So we sort of trace Facebook memories back to an earlier iteration when it was called On This Day, and a lot of the material that you know that sort of came out then Facebook memories building onto the, on on that feature and on the data that was learned and the, you know, sort of many of the insights that we learned from that feature. Uh, so one of the things that we learned from uh, one of the one of the earliest promotional material that came out about on this day is that a lot of the things that in, that were included, you know, that counted as a memory, were you know fairly mundane things like things you've uploaded on the platform, like uh, like photos, like uh, like videos and text as well. But then also more these sort of bigger milestones, like you know how long you've been friends with someone, how long you've been on the platform, um, you know, sort of anniversaries of different kinds. So so those things became like you know sort of almost the ground fodder for what could become a memory now the interesting thing for us as well was a lot of those things might seem very mundane and in many ways might not seem like a memory at all and, and now it becomes almost a political question of who defines you know the sort of the limits of what can be a memory really uh, and i think one of the big things that we found out or that we sort of took from 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 that early research was that that the definition of memory was very much caught up in a particular logic of well-being and, and happiness and positivity, because a lot of it was was it had to had to align with what Facebook was saying is that it has to be, you know, Facebook memory still has to be part of these well, you know, time well spent efforts that we're trying to do. So we're trying to keep people on platforms for as long as possible, really, and you know, for that to be possible, then we can't just throw memories at them that are tragic and sad because that's gonna in their mind, it's going to sort of reduce the, you know, the possibility that people are going to want to spend time on it. So one thing that we saw immediately was that the definition of memories started to become a bit more limited because they were immediately trying to uh, trying to filter out things automatically. Again, they were using different sort of algorithm features to do that, but they were trying to filter out memories that were things like if there were images that depicted uh, someone's ex, for example, or if there was a loved one who had died, memories like that that might might have the potential to cause a bit of grief or a bit of sadness. Those things were sort of, you know, as best to their possible, like best of their efforts was, you know, they attempted to basically filter them out. So the problem then is from the outset is that what they say is a memory, what we're sort of encountering on Facebook is already a sort of a filtered view of the past because it's very much memories that they would say are positive, are happy, that are going to increase our chances of staying on the platform for longer, really. Huh. Which is a very interesting filtration. I think that term really captures it. Dave, is there anything you'd like to add on this point? No, it's just um, that that kind of reshaping of the concept of memory to suit the logics of social media is really what we were what we were trying to get at, I think, that sort of reverse engineering of what memory is so that it suits the platform was the, the crucial thing, I think, in, in terms of the definition of memory there. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Ben, I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit more about kind of the factors that determine not just what this platform wants to consider as a memory, but also kind of how it makes these algorithmic decisions about which things resurface when in this particular packaging of facebook memory yeah sure i think i think one thing to to sort of take away as well is that obviously when we talk about automation when we talk about sort of the ideas of of, of you know algorithmic memories that we don't want to we don't want to then say that you know everything about this is algorithmic everything is is autom automated because one thing that we do in the book as well is that we trace the history of how the team working on the feature also went out and did, you know, they did qualitative interviews. They were trying to build up an idea of what people thought could be a good memory. And they were trying, they were putting them into themes and they were basically uh, sort of creating an idea of, of, you know, what could be a memory to people. But then what that basically did is that that basically operationalized and, and, it, and it formalized a problem for the ranking algorithm because it basically just said, what memory to resurface to who at what point? 
and that became then became it's just a question of of, of gathering data of, of basically just trying to see you know it becomes an algorithmic problem like everything else in a way so it becomes a question of not just the memories that you engage with because if you engage with memories one of the things that we're seeing in facebook and social media more generally but we're seeing it also in in the memories feature is that the more in, the more you engage with the Facebook memories and the more you engage with other people's Facebook memories, the more you will be exposed to them. So that also sort of, you know, adds to that sort of algorithmic logic that, you know, they will obviously, it, cre it creates different patterns of how to engage with the past really. Uh, but it was not just that they were, you know, sort of uh, resurfacing memories. They were resurfacing memories, you know, that were highly ranked that the algorithm was saying, well, what would be the, the best memory to resurface to this person at this point? Right, so that meant also that the, you know, what one um, one of the approaches that memory features in the past have used the sort of on the day feature, and what Facebook used to be, is that you take a memory from a year ago, and then on the day a year later you resurface it, and the problem is is that for that is that yes you will get a lot of good memories from it, but the problem is you're missing out on in you know if we take sort of the point of view of Facebook, is that you miss out on a lot of other potentially. Um, engaging memories so they will resurface memories irrespective of in many ways when it was so it could be like a seasonal memory for example here's your winter memories you could be a, a a memory just bundled together and to say here's a memory from your holiday and some of them are really hard to understand the sort of temporal logic behind it because there isn't a clear cut this was six months ago or this was 12 months ago and it's very much depends on you know how you've engaged with the feature what you've uploaded and also what other people like you have uploaded as well and what they like to engage with so mm, no that that's very helpful to take us through so that we understand kind of what it is that we're actually talking about what is happening on this platform so that we can then talk about the impacts and implications of this uh because that's kind of the obvious i think next question so dave can you maybe take us through those impacts and implications of these processes yeah, I mean, the, one of the things that you've seen is that this this um, open up of everyday life to the sort of politics of the archive. So one of the one of the implications of of this kind of taxonomization of of memories is that it creates limits or boundaries in what a memory is, what it can be, and and how how our memories are delivered to us. So those those boundaries, if you imagine them as kind of boxes, you know, Foucault spoke about there being a kind of grid. Uh, that we our encoded eyes put things into, you can see this going on here. So you've got a kind of um, the, by creating these classifications of memories, those boxes then limit what memories are and what becomes visible to us again in the future. So you're opening up something as as personal as memories and important to our biographies as as memory to the the kind of politics of the archive and imposing a metadata onto those thoughts and ideas about ourselves and our pasts so that seems to us to be an important implication the way that these these uh, ta this taxonomy can kind of demarcate parts of our lives and what that means for our identities so there are big implications here for how we remember individually and how we remember collectively and therefore for our individual and collective identities now and into the future as we continue to live with this these classifications of our of our past content as, as memories hmm. ben is there anything you'd like to add on that yeah because I, th I think what is sort of also um brings up this idea of, of both ranking and and the sort of classification of memories is that it's a really curious sort of uh, development going on as well because there's a lot of literature in the social sciences, especially to do with data and algorithms about social media and personalization. And in many ways, that is the case that the, that the, the, the Facebook feature is sort of, you know, being personalized to you as a user and, and it's your memories and, and on that platform. And we could maybe then say, well, isn't that quite a, almost a solipsistic, you know, sort of very isolated view of memory. But the thing is at the same time, what it really does is that it sort of it sort of troubles those boundaries between personal and collective because your memories are always made to matter in a way based on other people's attributes and, and Louis Amore in Cloud Ethics has written a lot about how the attributes of others, you know, when filtered and when processed by an algorithm can still have a bearing on, you know, how it treats you in a way. So 
for example, even if you don't use Facebook very much, the fact that people that you're friends with or people in your network, the way that they use a particular feature might then also impact how you use that feature and also what sort of memories you get from it. So it's really interesting to see that that obviously that the Facebook algorithm there is sort of, I think, also troubling the the line between sort of personal and collective memory there by, you know, by almost deconstructing everything down into into data and, and how everything, you know, it's a every data becomes a potential memory in a way. Wow. Lots of implications there. And I really appreciated that the book um, did have the space, being not a journal article, to um, not just think through these things, the two of you, but also ask people about kind of how they react to targeted memories in this way. So Ben, could you maybe tell us a bit about what you found when you asked people about this? Yes. Yeah, so so what we were sort of, um, obviously, like when we were at the research shape, we were doing uh, qualitative interviews and focus groups with, you know, sort of people from a variety of spectrum in terms of people who've used these features a lot and then people who might never have used this feature a lot, but then as we were using them together and we were sort of talking about, you know, what they liked and what they didn't like about. So there was sort of a great variety in terms of levels of engagement. Uh, but what we found was really interesting is there wasn't a just a particular response to it. Uh, there was sort of a, a, a quite a wide, wide variety of responses to, you know, how how good those memories are and or how bad they are. And actually, one of the things that we sort of from from the get go didn't want to say is that we didn't want to just look at, you know, how are these in a in a way negative. So we sort of wanted to go beyond that framework of saying, you know, are are they just this is a negative feature? This people are going to think negatively of it because what we found is that. In, in one way, people found it really useful. Uh, people found it really useful being reminded of certain things because people would then say, actually, a lot of the time, Facebook is reminding me of things. It doesn't mean anything. It's not a, it's not a thing. But then occasionally, it does remind me of a really interesting trip that I did with my friend or a really uh, great birthday that we had last year. And, and that brings back a lot of really good memories. And actually, in some ways, it, it instigated people to... Um, get back in touch with their sort of old friends or, or different family members. So so that was a point where we were actually saying that's a really interesting uh, use of the platform. And there was uh, there was another one in, that, in there as well where a lot of people were saying that they sometimes, especially after having seen typical memories, being reminded of them over and over again, especially if they've used the platform for years, is that they started to, the, 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 the line between what they thought of a memory and what the Facebook was showing them as a memory, that line started to become blurred because they couldn't really say, actually, is this just me remembering this? Or is it just, I've been reminded of this so often that now it's just become a memory to me, really. And, and that was one of the things that we were saying, one of the concepts that we uh, presented in the book called promotion of the memorable, where we're sort of saying that, yes, even though there is, it is important to keep, you know, a distinction between data and memories you know obviously any data is not just memories but at the same time it's not as simple either because in many ways a lot of the sort of the algorithmic processes that are you know going on behind the scenes are actually participating in generating memories for people or actually transforming things into memories so where people would say well they are as real to me as i would any other memory really and that was quite a curious find in many ways um Secondly, we, we found that people were finding it, especially if they didn't use the platform very often, they found the platform to be quite inadequate. It didn't really get to, it just felt a bit out of touch. It didn't feel like authentic. And a lot of people were, especially people who were, you know, didn't use Facebook loads or didn't upload very much or didn't engage with they they said that it felt felt empty and artificial where the algorithm was constantly trying to show them things and they weren't really... It wasn't really engaging for them. Um, thirdly, we found that, um, that that memories were also just, as I mentioned before, just completely wrong as well. So whereas Facebook would show people something and they would be like, no, hold on, this is not what happened at all at this point in time, or this is with the wrong person, or this is uh, this image is bundled together in the, in the wrong context that actually belongs over here. But what we found is that even those sort of... Um, sort of mishaps in a way, they still showed something about the logic of how the platform works and how the algorithm works, but also it sort of it sort of began sort of a particular engagement with their past, with people's past. So still, even though when the algorithm was wrong, people still 
engaged with it in a way, which is quite curious. Uh, and then lastly, that we also found that these memories could be intrusive, that they they felt creepy, especially because people on Facebook is one of those platforms that is known for, or Facebook memories is a feature that's known for being quite active in promoting and in repackaging certain memories and automating that process more than other um, features such as, for example, time hop, which takes a much more passive approach and much more of the onus on the user as well. So we were just, I think we were just, you know, in short, just trying to identify variety of different experiences and how people try to make sense of these platforms and these memories and not just to say Facebook memories or digital memories is just this one thing um, because it can be sort of a, a plethora of, of different things that have different sort of emotional connections underlying them as well. No, absolutely. And I think that that answer um, demonstrates the range and also highlights some tension, some kind of weirdness and uncertainty about this. So Dave, I'm wondering if you can maybe pick up that point and tell us a bit about some of the tensions that you've identified around this idea of classifying and ranking memories on social media like this. Yeah. And and those the things that Ben's identified there about the struggles over attention and um, over misconceptions of what a memory is by the system or um, that the, that these are reductive ideas or that they're invasive or and creepy, whatever it might be. Those things fed into a kind of tensions around this automatic classification and ranking of memories in social media. So as Ben said, we're not really thinking about whether it's bad. What we want to try to do is is understand what it's like to live when you've got these memories delivered to you automatically through algorithms as part of a broader transformation that algorithms might bring to, to social life. And in this case, it's it's probably not surprising, but that something as kind of personal as a memory, um, when that is automatically classified and ranked, it does create some tensions, some resistances, some questions are posed. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily go smoothly um, in lots of cases. Now, one of the things that I've been reflected on since that we finished the book is I'm wondering about how these systems are learning from the data that they produce in the production of, of memories and how they're learning in response to the reaction that a memory gets once it's repackaged for somebody. So when somebody receives a memory, what action do they take? It's in social media, for instance, on their phone. How are they, re- are they sharing it? Are they commenting? Is it creating activity? Is it creating a kind of stickiness in the platform on the device? And so over time and since we finished this book are these systems still learning from the data that's being produced that's one of the things and and if so then is that changing the tensions that are created through the we use image in tyler's term of classificatory struggles the way they struggle with the way their memories are being classified in this instance we kind of repurpose that wider terminology for this book so we we were thinking these things are creating tensions for people are kind of um, questions and problems as their memories automatically classified and ranked. But going on from that now, I'm wondering about um, how these systems, through the data they produce, will be altering and reclassifying and, and altering the way that the algorithm ranks memories in response to the data produced through the previous automatic production of memory. So that's kind of an ongoing question now about the way that the data feed back into the production of memories and that then shapes how those memories are reproduced within these systems into the future. Yeah, because that adds something really interesting because if, if, it, if they do learn from those engagements with, with, with the memories, which, um, which intuitively they probably do, don't they? I mean, um, because it's valuable data as well, like to optimize their algorithm as well. But it, be, it then becomes interesting, as you say, like over time, what happens? Because it then, in, in many ways, those memories become quite iterative. Like they, over time, just start to refer back to memories, not like that exist outside the platform, a picture you took in nature somewhere, but it, it all becomes about referring back to your engagement with the platform. So it becomes really interesting that how, how inescapable the platforms then become to are, you know, remembering back. Because then I guess, and it's it's a question that David's also raised before, is that what happens then if the platform didn't exist, if the platform shut down or if the platform, you know, if that data was somehow lost, what happens not just to the data itself, but what happens to 
you know, our sort of our memories, our ideas of self, our ideas about, you know, how we engage with the past and stuff, like how how entangled have we now become with these platforms? Yeah. And how entangled has our memory become over time? Memories become requirement. I mean the book with the book here was a snapshot of the tensions of the classification ranking of memories in social media. But this is a kind of moving picture. So we've tried to develop some concepts there about the surfacing of memories, the auto product, automatic production memory and the, the tensions that we've identified so that these could be of, of ongoing use. But as we see now, um, you know, that you can alter pictures on your phone uh, to remove people from the background, change your facial expressions and these sorts of things. That adds an, 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 a new dimension to this uh, classification and ranking of memories because these could be images that have been altered as well uh, as part of everyday routine of memory making. That it's the logic of the platforms and devices. And yeah, it sort of I, adds I think... that. Oh, sorry. It's sorry, around okay. it. No, no but it, it it sort of it sort of resonates what we were saying earlier about filters because it it sort of I guess resonates with you know people using filters in their images because it's almost become taken for granted now that the images that we see on social media are to a certain extent filtered like they have used varieties of filters to you know add lightning or shade or different done different things with it but I mean to what extent are future generations just going to take it for granted that all their memories are filtered in some ways that people have been removed from them or they've been you know sort of perfected in different ways or i mean it, it does something really interesting in terms of how you move forward because how we engage with the past also very much determines how we you know collect memories moving forward in many ways mm -hmm. no absolutely i think this book um does a great job of being dave as you said a snapshot but also of surfacing tensions and questions that are very much unresolved and will continue to be open questions. So it does a lot of useful things in a very small package. Um, and I know that I found a lot of things in it that despite how embedded we all are in these platforms, um, I have seen Facebook memories, but I still read this and was like, oh, wait, hang on, I hadn't thought of it that way. Or, oh, I hadn't put these things together. So I found surprising elements to it, but I'm always curious if there's anything that authors find surprising, given how much closer you are to the material. So perhaps starting with Dave and then moving to Ben, is there anything during the research or the writing of this book that you found particularly surprising? I I was quite um I was quite intrigued when Ben uncovered the use of qualitative research within the commercial sector that's being used as part of that initial classification and ranking process I thought that was really interesting um example of uh, um uh, of, of what sort of mike savage john law evelyn rupert have called the social life of methods you know that you've got this embedded kind of practice within these within the within these organizations I thought that was that was that kind of caught by surprise a little bit i thought it might be a bit blunt at all on that um and also the the nature of the 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 ranking of memory, I just think it's a real, that, that kind of is still quite a surprising thing. The idea that you can kind of turn your memories into a sort of league table of the things that are most memorable or most important on some logic. I, I think it's an idea that, you, I, interesting, you can take the kind of logic of the league table and of ranking to something as kind of um, intang untangible as, as memory. I think that that shows the reach of that kind of 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 way of thinking you know what i've called the past kind of metric power you can you can see that to take it the ranking that logic of ranking to something as as personal as and as uh, uh, as as memory seems to me to be show just how far that the data infrastructure and it's the, log the related logics of kind of uh, league tabling and ranking and so on has become. That's a great one. Ben, have you got one? Yeah, I mean, the two I was going to mention, I mean, one of them was exactly that, what, what Dave was just saying about the qualitative data. Like, uh, I did find that quite surprising because I, I, th I think we do sometimes have a tendency to make everything about the algorithm. And even though the algorithm is incredibly important, it's, it's sometimes... It sometimes obfuscates just how much, you know, sort of social messiness goes on underneath. 
uh, because the the sort of um, the report that we use that we that we sort of draw the data from in writing the book, um, the, the research called Arctic Conrad, he mentions that the on on this day feature was built, you know, it was based on fifteen different research projects that all were building on on top of each other, basically. So I, I think. I think it's hard because like, you know, when we come to something like this, we see the finished product, everything looks very smooth, looks very automated, frictionless. But but I guess the interesting thing is exactly like just, you know, the, the extent of, you know, the, the, the sociality that goes underneath that's that's kind of hidden, you know, that sort of social labor that goes on underneath. Um, so I think one thing that would have been very interesting to see is just, you know, the sort of the kind of um, taxonomies or the different kind of rankings that didn't work. It'd be really interesting to see, like, where did they go wrong? What sort of versions of the memories feature did they scrap? You know, which which one did they choose away? You know, in, in, in you know in favor of the one that we have now. And all of that is obviously we don't have that. We can speculate, but it, it I think it sort of brings attention to that. I mean, the other thing, just br- really briefly, I, I was sort of very struck by how many people were talking about these features as providing them with memories that they couldn't tell if if it was real or not uh, and that was something because i think i think there is also a temptation uh when we study um, social media and digital media in general that that any form of mediation technical mediation is some sort of seen as once removed from the real world as memory in the brain or you know memory you know that we have amongst each other or embodied memory or something like that and technical memory that's kind of it's a bit more fake it's more artificial but the amount of people who actually talked about memory as being like, well, actually, no, I think a lot of those memories are real, or at least I can't distinguish between what I think is is real and what's not, because it it's come to it's come to matter to me on an emotional level that it hasn't before. So yeah, I I think those two things. Mm, those are again great things. Thank you both for sharing those surprises with us. As a final question, um, I am very curious, kind of given how much is still out there on this topic, but of course, how many other things there are for any of us to research. I'm curious, um, now that this book is out, uh, whether there's anything you each individually or perhaps together are working on, whether or not it's a book, whether or not it's on this exact topic that you'd like to preview or highlight. Uh, Ben, perhaps starting with you? Yeah, so um, I I think I... So basically, I started a right after I finished my PhD. I um, I then taught for a bit at, at York, and then I, I took up a a three year research post uh, at Durham uh, with uh, Louisa Moore's project, which was on sort of algorithmic societies, looking at machine learning, looking at ethics. So a lot of the work afterwards that I've been doing now focuses very much on looking at sort of machine learning on a, on a technical level, but also looking at how sort of ideas of ethics are being uh, sort of transformed through a lot of the new models that we're seeing now. So we're looking, we're, we're uh, examining a lot of stuff to do with generative modeling. So like a lot of the generative AI that we're seeing now is that we're looking at and, and researching how those are being, and not just how they're being embedded in society, but actually looking at the infrastructure and like, and also the architectures that computer science papers outline. Um, personally, I've been very intrigued with this idea of, Soviet, of synthetic data of what happens when you have machine learning algorithms generating data for other algorithms to be trained on. Um, and that's something that's becoming increasingly uh, common now, especially with generative AI. So for example, with ChatGPT generating text that other sort of language models can be trained on basically, and looking at the implications of that, but also looking at the possibilities that opens up for um, for how it sort of transforms politics and ethics, because one one problem I'm looking at particularly is if you if you for example are have a data set or or a facial recognition algorithm, let's say, and it it misrecognizes black people, for example, or people of color or people of minorities at a higher level of frequency than white people, so let's say, then the uh, a lot of the critique that we've had from a social science point of view has been say a lot of those algorithms it's it's not representative enough. It needs to, we need to sort of create more, you know, balanced algorithms and things. Synthetic data now is, is offering um, kind of engineers and, and policymakers. It's basically opening a way for them to say, well, okay, if we're missing uh, black faces from our data set, well, let's use an algorithm to generate extra faces of, of 
black images that we can then incorporate into our data and make it balanced in inverted commas. And what does that do to our, our ideas of ethics when actually any missing data that you can have, you can just generate and sort of incorporate afterwards? So so that's the question I'm looking at right now. I think I think the reason why it's quite nice looking at that as well, and and, and um, or, or, or at least taking a break from the memory surface, I think with the book and with some of the papers that we uh, that I've also worked on with Dave, is, is it was it was nice taking a break from sort of the memory side of things because I think we'd said, or at least for me, I think I'd said what I wanted to say, and it's now quite nice to sort of wait a couple of years to just to see how the field develops, to see how society develops, and how people are engagement with social media memory sort of how it moves and and yeah so i I, th I think it was this was very much a snapshot of time and, and I'm, I'm sort of now excited to see the next snapshot in a way brilliant thank you dave what about you uh yeah i'm, I'm carrying on with the trying to understand the sort of lived experience of algorithms a little bit more and um, I, i'm working on a project on um algorithms the use of algorithms in housing decisions um which is a project led by alice and wallace at york and funded by the Nuffield Foundation. So we're, we're trying to understand the role of algorithms in decision-making in, in housing there. So, um, And then that, that spills off. I've uh, finished a book that came out a, about a year or so ago called The uh, the Tensions of Algorithmic Thinking. And that book ended with uh, a, a section on what I call the will to automate. And I'm hoping to carry on developing uh, my ideas about the tensions algorithms create, but in relation to the will to automate, which is the kind of desire to uh, to uh, uh, apply algorithms and machine learning and AI to ever more parts of the social world. So I'm hoping to, to uh, if things go well, to be able to build on that. And I'm just doing some other stuff on uh, culture and classification using George Zimmel and uh, popular culture uh, and, and various other things on the side. Hmm. All right. Well, intriguing projects, all of them. Thank you both for sharing. And if any listeners um, want to read more about this snapshot, about this uh, conversation opener in a lot of ways book that we've been discussing, again, the title is Social Media and the Automatic Production of Memory, Classification, Ranking and the Sorting of the Past, published by Bristol University Press. Ben, Dave, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much.